Welcome to the NWR Australian Explorers Conference. And my name is Kerry Stevenson. Next up, we have Mamba Exploration, ASX Code's M24. To tell us the latest updates, straight back from the Kimberley, Mike Dunbar is the Managing Director. Mike, I'm looking forward to this. Lots of news coming out. Tell us what's happening. It's, we're actually now really um, yeah, hitting, hitting our straps. We've got a, got a team in place now and really hitting the straps, as, as I say, on on exploration on multiple fronts, uh, which is really quite an exciting period for us. So it's um, it, it's busy, but that's a I mean, it's a good busy to, to to have this time of year. So yeah, really quite an exciting time. So what I thought I might do is just quickly run through a snapshot of of who we are and where we are, and then run through the projects and really explain why we're in our particular projects, um, why we like them, and where we're going from there. And also, okay. if I can just before you get going, uh, just let people know that are on this uh, call, please, if you've got questions at any time, pop them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom there, and we will uh, we will answer them as we go along. So any questions you've got, pop them in the Q&A, and we will answer them as we go. Thanks, Mike. Right. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, so a little bit of a snapshot of, of, of who we are and where we are. I won't bore you too much with this slide, but there are really, I think, four key aspects um, to making a successful discovery. Um, firstly, obviously, as a team, we've got a really good team uh, and just got a, a dedicated field team in, in place now, which is great. Um, secondly, is obviously the projects. If without, without projects, you're not going to make a discovery. Um, and then so the, the third and fourth really are the corporate structure uh, being very, very tightly held and with very few shares on issue, uh, which we are with 61 million shares on issue. Um, and as although one shareholder will be upset with me saying this, um, funding is also a critical component, uh, and we are well funded. So it's it, it's a you could, when you get all four of those together, um, you can then lead the company into to making making substantial discoveries. We're running through where our projects are and why we selected them, um, and we're a little bit different to to most. Um, all of our projects are are based outside the Yulgarn. Uh, most people, most junior explorers will, will run back into the Yulgarn and explore there. However, if you look at the major discoveries that have been made in Western Australia over the last, say, 20 years, they're all outside uh, the Yulgarn. So if you look at the major Greenfields gold discoveries, for example, um, you've got Tropicana outside the Yulgarn, as Gruyere is right on the edge of the Yulgarn, um, Alawinda, Havileron, um, and Hemi, all outside the Yulgarn. And so it's, yeah, juniors will tend to run back into the Yulgarn, um, but really if you're wanting to be exploring for the large, big projects, the edges are outside is, is in my view the place to be. But then also if you look at the, the base metal um, sphere, also those projects have been on the basin margins or large sedimentary basins in the case of one of them. So you've got Bulama, uh, Nova Bollinger Discovery, and, and mine, uh, Savannah North up in the Kimberley, and Winnu. So all of them are outside. So that's why we've chosen our projects, which are all outside or outside or on the edge of the Yulgar. Um, why, and why, sorry to interrupt you, Mike. Why is that? Why, it, 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 why do you say that that's where the major discoveries are? They're out on the edge or outside? The Yulgar has been very, very well explored for a long time. Um, it, there's a history of over 100 years of exploration in the Yulgar around Kalgoorlie, for example. Um, and a lot of the big discoveries, um, if you actually look at look at um, any any mineral province, large discoveries tend to be made early in the in the in the exploration history. Okay. And and really, that's no different in in, in Western Australia. And that a lot of the large discoveries, I believe, in the Yulgarn have been found. Um, and we're talking greenfields exploration. We're not talking brownfields redevelopments or exploring around a a, a mine, but um, yeah, we're talking true greenfields exploration uh, discoveries. And so going outside the normal area people people explore is, is, is really our mantra and why we're, we've got our projects where we have and why we believe there's potential for, for big discoveries in the area. What I'll do is just run through our projects, our four projects, and uh, they're really split up into to two main areas. Um, and the first is, Projects we, that we can work in summer. Um, now, Kerry is smiling because she's she's seen me present this before. Um, but we're very strategically and and deliberately chosen projects that we can work in summer, 
um, been the, the Great Southern Project, uh, the Calliope Creek Project, Gold Project in the Great Southern, and the Darling Range Project just outside of Perth. Now those two projects we can work in the summer months. Um, it's very difficult to work those areas in winter, um, A, because of the rains and, um, and access, but also, um, and also crops are in the, in the fields, for example, for farmland. Um, and so we try and work with our communities rather than against them. So if we can work with our local farmers, for example, and explore when their crops are off, um, there's less, less um, angst, if you like, between, between us and the, 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 the local community. And I think that's a really important aspect to do as well. Nice. Uh, nice. The second area is, I mean, up the winter projects. Uh, and for those who have been up into the Kimberley, for example, in the middle of, middle of summer, uh, will know you do not want to be there in the middle of summer when it's uh, the, the field team's literally just flying back as we speak. Um, yesterday I was 39 degrees and about 90% humidity. Oh, yuck. It's only, it's only going to get hotter and, and wetter from now on. So if you can avoid working in those environments, um, and we can by having summer projects and winter projects, we can work in the, in the areas we can be most effective year round. And so the, the winter projects are the East Kimberley project, in particular the Copper Flats project, a very, very large project, and I'll come to all of these in more detail, um, and the Ashburton Gascoigne project. Now, there's a slight twist on the Gascoigne and, uh, and Ashburton project uh, that we haven't really mentioned before, and, I, and I'll get to that um, uh, later in the presentation. So running through each of them, uh, the Calliope Creek Gold Project, as I mentioned, is in the Great Southern of Western Australia. It's a, a modest sized project, um, but it's got three main prospects within the, the, the tenement package we have down there. Uh, a northern prospect area, a central prospect area, and where we've spent most of our, our activities in the, in the southern prospect. Now, the southern prospect has had very, very little work done, only surface scratchings really um, for, for most of its, its um, existence, uh, whereas the other ones have had some more substantial exploration undertaken. So at this area um, and in that the whole project itself, we identified a four kilometre long coil anomaly. Um, four kilometres long, some people say ho-hum. The difference here is we've got very high grades, up to 2.8 grams in soil sampling. And you can trace that, that anomaly all the way through. And it goes through each of the, the, the three prospects we have. We've only drilled uh, the southern prospect so far and only tested it for around 500 metres of strike length uh, and, and to a depth of around 35 metres. Now, a lot of people in the Yilgarn, for example, will be drilling through 35 metres of cover before they even get to their, to their, their main target area. Our areas of interest stick out of the ground uh, and it's fresh rock and mineralised at surface, which is quite unique. Looking at the, the drilling we've done, and we did it earlier this year, um, we've drilled 32 holes in the, in the um, Southern Prospect. 27 of those, not a remarkable strike rate, uh, had significant mineralisation up uh, over half a gram. Um, now that includes 15 metres at 2.2 from one metre downhole, 15 at just over two, uh, from three metres downhole. So we're not having to drill through substantial amounts of cover. And that's really the important part for us. So we've defined a, a zone that's currently around 500 metres of strike length. The next phase, and importantly only to a depth of around 35 metres vertically. The next stage is to expand that to uh, around a kilometre of, of strike length, uh, we're hoping, uh, and start to chase it to, to a greater depth. So, so that's the next program that we'll undertake. Uh, in the coming summer months. When you say a greater depth, uh, Mike, have you got an idea of what sort of depth you're going to? Yeah, most of those holes are on average will be about 70 metres, um, 70 to 80. We can put a few deeper holes in, but not many. Um, really, the key for us is to identify the, the strike potential first um, before starting to chase it to depth. There's no point in chasing um, uh, mineralization to depth if you've got such a short strike length that you'll never be able to drive a pit on it or you'll never actually be able to come up with a, a decent sized resource and so stretching it um, in the shallow depths first and then after that's done we'll start chasing it to a greater depth so it's very systematic and that's that's one thing that that um, hopefully will come through in this presentation we do 
deliberately undertake very systematic exploration and we don't go blazing in with RC rigs or, or drilling willy nilly because fundamentally if we do that we can spend a lot of money uh, blow a lot of shareholders funds uh, and not get anywhere yeah so systematic very carefully man managed exploration is, is really our key I'm moving to the Darling Range project uh, just outside of Perth um, it's only 30 kilometres from the, the world-class Julemar discovery that Chalice made a couple of years ago. Um, the one difference we have is we are in farmland. Um, Julemar itself, the, the Gondeville intrusion right to the south of which is their main deposit, is in farmland as well, but very quickly it um, progresses into state forest. We don't have state forest where we are, it's all farmland, which comes with its own challenges, mind you, and, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but We've already identified a, a six kilometre long ultramafic trend in our project area up to the north. Our project itself, the, the Black Hills project, uh, we've identified, as I mentioned, a six kilometre long um, platinum palladium anomaly. And in that, we've identified two main target areas, the northern target area and the southern target. Very imaginatively named, I must admit, but anyway. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> um, I, I mentioned land access. Uh, land access working and working with your local farmers is, is critical uh, in any environment, uh, but particularly here where it is in the wheat belt. Uh, and there's a, this is some of the better um, cropping land in, in Western Australia. You do need to work with your lo local farmers. So we had a, a target of the northern area and the farmer very quickly let us on to continue our exploration and, and drill some targets there. Now that was a second order target. It wasn't our best target. We had, had identified from our airborne EM, um, but it was a, a substantial conductive horizon in its own right. The southern target area was in a different farm, and that farmer was, was more reluctant to, to engage with us. And so building a level of trust and, and building a relationship takes time. And so we've recently just uh, managed to secure land access. Uh, since I spoke to you last, Kerry, we We've secured land access to that southern high priority target area, uh, and we'll be doing ground EM uh, on that in the coming weeks. In fact, um, late, very late this quarter is, is the plan at this stage, uh, and then leading after that um, towards drilling once the crops have, take, have been harvested. Normally, that's in November, late, uh, late November, early December. And it really just depends on when the when the season breaks um, and when the crops are harvested in that area. So it will either be late Q4 this year or early Q1 next year that we'll get in there and start drilling that high priority target. And that's exciting because it's the first time we've ac had access to what the geophysicists think is, is the, the highest priority target in the area. But that's, how'd you, really, how'd you really turn really them around, awesome. Mike? How'd you, how'd you turn your land holder around? Oh, negotiation and time. Um, and just making him, and not sorry, not making him, um, allowing him to appreciate what we were doing and what our exploration meant and him seeing what we did uh, and the, the exploration we did at the northern farm because he, he's, he's a, the, the southern farmer, the northern farmer led us on and he saw, the southern farmer saw very quickly uh, the type of exploration we were doing, the rehabilitation we did um, right. and, and, and commit to and, and the understanding that, that we do do the right thing um, and we do not, the type of company that will just go in, rip, tear, bust, if you like, and, and make a hell of a mess. Um, and that's really important to build that relationship. And so that's that's how, if you like, we turn him around. Um, and it takes time and patience. And sometimes shareholders do get a bit impatient with us on that, but uh, it's far more important to take the time to build the relationship than just try and um, force your way in. Absolutely, totally agree. So moving um, away from our, our summer projects, which we're, we're going to be starting to work on more actively now, uh, into our winter projects, uh, and in particular the Copper Flats project up in the East Kimberley. Now I was up there um, well, about 10 days ago, a week ago, 10 days ago now, um, and it really is quite a remarkable system that we have at Copper Flats. Um, and to put it into perspective the size of the, of the target, Oh, sorry, the size of the, the, the Copper flats, flats tenement. Now, the viewers will be all over Australia, I'm sure. Um, but to put it into perspective, um, if you're in Western Australia, that tenement package reaches from the northernmost 
suburb of Perth down to Mandurah, some over 100 kilometres, and from the from the hills in the east of, of Perth to the coast. So it's a massive area. If you're in Sydney, it, it that tenement package would stretch from Sydney to Newcastle, and oh, from wow. the head, and from the heads to Parramatta. So so a very <laughs> very large tenement package. Massive. If you're in Melbourne, Melbourne to Ballarat. So we're talking very, very large tenement package. Now that comes with its own challenges, uh, which really I'll, I'll come to uh, in the next couple of slides. When you have an area of uh, in excess of 2,300 square kilometres to explore, where do you go? Yeah. Um, and and, and where do you go first? And how do you explore such a massive area? Now, when I was up there last week, um, we visited a number of the historical um, prospects area four and five, and, and I must apologize, I really need to come up with some better names for those. Um, <laughs> some very, very high grade copper and silver mineralization at surface. And you can see a photo on the, on the left there uh, of the outcrop of, of area four. Now that historically ran over 30% copper um, and very, very high grade silver. Um, but you can see in the blue line um, on the, on the right-hand image there, it stretches pretty much the entire Line, length of the tenement package. Now that's the edge of the basin, and that that edge. And I won't bore the, the, the viewers with all of the details. If they want more details, feel free to call me. Um, but that package is variably altered all the way along, and so you've got a package of, and an area, massive area to explore. So the best way of exploring an area of, of that magnitude really is to come up with a very very um, good target area. And we've identified that northeastern area in particular. Now, the conceptual model that we're working to, and the reason we've got this conceptual model is it helps define where we want to be and where we're going to explore first. So there are multiple styles of mineralization in the area. Um, so from sand volcanoes at the very top, uh, right on the edge of the, of the, sedim of the sedimentary basin, uh, you have basinal growth faults, which uh, worldwide are very key to this style of mineralization. You also have strata bound mineralization and flow top breccia styles. So it's these flow top breccia, for example, that stretches for 100 kilometers. Um, so you need to identify each target area and how you explore each of those areas. And that's what we've really done now with, with the exploration we've undertaken. So this is just zooming in on the, the northeastern part of Copper Flats. We identified at area four and five in those orange circles. Um, back in 2006, it goes back that far, the, the rock chip samples were undertaken. 240, sorry, 254 samples were taken. 82 had more than 2% copper within them. Uh, and 28 had more than 10% copper. So remarkable system. What we need to understand is where does that mineralization go? And, and how do we best explore that mineralization at greater depths to where we can see some sulfide mineralization. So we've undertaken uh, air, airborne EM, sorry, airborne magnetic interpretation and identified these basinal growth faults that you can see in red and, and magenta. They cross cut through and are coincident with the very high grade copper that we've seen in area five, area four and area four east. So yeah, Really, we're now starting to see that not, every, not only are we seeing that surface, but we're seeing some controlling structures running through that area. Um, another style of mineralization that I, that I mentioned a moment ago was the, the strata bound uh, Nelson Shale mineralization. Uh, that's an area further to, the, further to the north and west of the limestone area. We've just finished a 2,600 sample point soil sampling program. Uh, assayed about half of that already uh, using a portable XRF. Uh, we, we released those, those results today. Uh, and we've identified a, a copper anomaly that extends for more than four and a half kilometers and remains open along strike. So again, knowing the style of mineralization and targeting that um, depending on where you are in the system is important. However, uh, that's only really part of the story then. Is this, and these growth faults, uh, we've done some regional airborne AM um, modeling and identified a number of bedrock conductors to the east of area five. So we are also about to undertake next month um, a very large airborne EM survey uh, of over 2,000 line kilometers of airborne EM 
uh, to cover that entire north and northern area. And that will help determine the, the targets along strike, uh, along those, in my view, will show targets along those, those growth structures. Hopefully it does, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and that will then lead to drilling next year. So quite an exciting Mike, period. Did you, were these all separate tenements at one stage and you pulled it all together? Or yeah. all um, as one? Yes, some of the, some of these tenements were were acquired as part of um, the listing of Mamba. When we when we formed Mamba, we identified these targets, um, identified that uh, they had been explored um, back in the early two thousands and two thousand six seven eight, uh, and then they they, they fell um, uh, off people's radar for a very long time. So we got about half of them when we formed Mamba, and subsequent exploration we we've identified more than doubled the size of that project, um, which we, we pegged um, last, year. Um, uh, Kevin, last year. Kevin, Kevin's just asked uh, if you can answer this, I'm not sure, annual holding costs for such large areas of tenements and is there a minimum expenditure required? Yes, the, uh, and there is when the tenements are granted. Some of these tenements are not granted yet. Um, and so, we're, and we're working through getting those tenements granted. Um, so when it's that large, um, generally speaking, for the first few years of any, of any tenement package, uh, you have a uh, holding cost of around um, $1,000, not around, $1,000 per graticular block. So one second of latitude by one second of, of uh, longitude is a, is a graticular block in Western Australia. And that costs you $1,000 per, per, um, uh, per right. graticular block. So the holding cost on that entire package um, if it was all all to be granted and not relinquished, uh, would be about seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, however, we're, what, only one of the tenements so far is is granted, um, and um, it, that comes with some challenges in its own right. Um, but we, are, as we're working through that 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 process, we will very rapidly, because of the size and the holding annual holding costs, um, reduce the size of the tenement package from this exploration, a very large area. We'll start to whittle it down. Quite aggressively, in fact, um, to to smaller areas that we can manage longer term. So yeah, it, it is an important aspect. But because these some of these tenements aren't granted, um, then the holding cost at the moment is, is two hundred thousand dollars for an entire year. So it, it's manageable, and it is something that we have to actively manage. Um, last but not least, mentioning the the Gascoigne the Ashburton Gascoigne project. Um, now. Historically, I mentioned it was a gold project, and it is, um, but there's been a fair bit of activity in the, in the Gascoigne in, in recent months, um, and a lot of rare earth discoveries have been made. Um, and so we've actually revisited um, all of the data for our project to, to better identify the potential of that system. So what we have at the, at the Ashburton Gascoigne project is three tenements, again, reasonable size, um, historical gold workings and up to four, four meters of 20 grams in RC drilling uh, has never really been properly fleshed out at, at surface yet. Um, but that's that's really only part of the part of the story. Um, as I mentioned, very large regional structures run through that, that tenement package. And um, recent exploration that's been done undertaken by Kingfisher Resources, uh, for example, who will be presenting tomorrow. And, and I'm looking forward to um, so to see what they've got to say about about the region, because I do know the gas going reasonably well, um, yeah. but it's uh, it's yeah, an, an exciting area, and they've made some some very high grade uh, rare earth discoveries. I'm looking forward to seeing what they have to say, and also Dreadnought Resources, um, uh, just to the southeast of us, uh, has all, have also come up with some very very substantial rare earth discoveries in recent in recent months. So we've assessed that area. That area and in particular the Northern Tenement Package, and reprocessed some radiometric data that um, is existing in the area. And you can see all of the gold prospects sit over in that um, radiometric low area. Um, however, a number of rare, well, a number of anomalies that have similar characteristics to the, the anomalies that have resulted in the discoveries of, at, at uh, Kingfisher and uh, Dreadnought, um, there are a number of anomalies off to the to the east and northeast of the gold area uh, that have never been looked at. Now we haven't literally; we've just um, started to to do this work now, 
uh, it will be up there. Uh, we the, that might be the royal we. It may not be. May, it might be the the, the team instead. Um, Just running out we'll, of time, Mike. Um, uh, we're, we're then uh, going up there in in Q4. Um, so in summary, we've got four very very good projects. Um, Calab Creek and Darling Range, we're actively going to be exploring the next few months in, in summer. Uh, Kimberley and the Ashburton, uh, and Ashburton Gascoigne, we continue to explore and a very, very large, interesting tenement package there as well. So that's uh, that's the sto story of Mamba at this stage and look forward to um, seeing where it ends going forward. Uh, Mike, thanks so much. We are running out, of, we are actually out of time, but very quickly, Kevin's just asked, what's your annual exploration budget? And how do you split it between summer and winter? If you can do that in a short, short answer. <laughs> yeah, look, um, exploration budget this year will be about $1.8 to $2 million, uh, thereabouts. Uh, it will, this year we'll be spending more on the southern projects, mainly because we'll be drilling at Calout Creek and, and, um, and Darling Range. So it'll be about 1.2 in, in the southern projects, depending on results. And northern area will be spending about Eight hundred thousand know, dollars, two hundred and fifty in the next month on that airborne EM um, uh, uh, survey. So, yeah, that that's roughly our, our expenditure over the next uh, over the next year. Uh, Mike Dunbar from Mambra Exploration, thanks so much for a very fascinating. You have been a busy guy, and we look forward to the news flow coming forward to, for the rest of the year. Thanks for joining us at the NWI conference today. Great, thanks very much, Kerry, and thanks for all the listeners.